Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Ashman family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Ashman family JCC empowers you to experience Jewish paths toward a life of joy, purpose, and meaning through innovative Jewish learning and wellness programs, community building, and initiatives to develop the next generation of Jewish leaders. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 251. Judaism? Just how unbound? Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rothberg. And we hope you had a happy Thanksgiving, a strange one, like most of our holidays this year have been strange, but hopefully still a good one in a certain way. And another holiday is coming up very soon, Hanukkah. And so let us take this opportunity to wish you a happy Hanukkah. We are holding an eight-night extravaganza where we are having all kinds of Judaism Unbound guests come and have a little bit of conversation about Hanukkah and about Judaism and about what's going on these days. We are going to do some creative ritual reimaginings and celebrations for Hanukkah, and we're going to have some time just to talk with you and just to spend a little time not just talking at you, but talking with you on Zoom as much as that's possible. And so we're hoping that some of the challenges of Hanukkah this year are actually going to allow us through Judaism Unbound to create a Judaism Unbound Hanukkah experience in a new way, and we'll see where that takes us. We're actually doing that experience this year as a bit of a fundraiser. We're not trying to raise a lot of money, or we're not trying to raise a lot of money from individual people. We're actually trying to raise a little bit of money from a lot of people and see how that works. So we're calling it our Hanukkah Gelt Raiser. If you are willing to share some of your Hanukkah Gelt with us, we are asking only for $36, or you can just sign up to make a monthly contribution of just $3 a month. That amounts to $36 over the course of a year you will receive an invitation to this eight-night extravaganza via Zoom. Some of our favorite guests and friends are going to be there. We're really excited about it. Just head over to a special website that we've created, www.geltraiser.com. That's G-E-L-T-R-A-I-S-E-R.com. You can also just go to the Judaism Unbound homepage, judaismunbound.com, or the Jewish Live homepage, jewishlive.org, and all of those have a link to the Gelt Razor on that page. By the way, if you want to just give a donation and you don't want to go to the Gelt Razor, you don't have to. It's unbound. It's totally optional. No matter what you want to do in terms of the event, we would love it and be grateful if you would give us a small gift this year. We've often thrown out the idea that maybe you could just donate a dollar for every hour of fun Judaism Unbound has given you over the course of the year. So if you're with us occasionally, maybe that amounts to $18 or $36 if you want to come to the Gelt Razor. And if you are here every week, then maybe $50. And if you've just been binging on all the Jewish Live content that there is, then you can add that up. But whatever you're able to give, we're extremely grateful and we really want to share our Hanukkah light with you. And we're really hoping that you'll want to share your Hanukkah gelt and light with us. So now let's jump into today's conversation. Our guest today is Mara Benjamin. She is the author of a fantastic book called The Obligated Self, Maternal Subjectivity and Jewish Thought. This is a little bit of an extension of the series we recently concluded on Judaism and feminism. Mara Benjamin contends that the physical and psychological work of caring for and rearing children for centuries the province of women is theologically fruitful, but a largely unexplored terrain for feminists. Mara Benjamin's contemporary feminist stance forges a convergence between Jewish theological anthropology and the demands of parental caregiving. We're always really interested in exploring new ways to look at Judaism, so we're really excited to do that work to explore everything that we've talked about and thought about through this particular lens. Mara Benjamin is the Irene Kaplan Lewant professor and chair of Jewish studies at Mount Holyoke College. She holds a PhD in modern Jewish thought and religious studies from Stanford University. Her book, The Obligated Self, received the 2019 American Academy of Religion Award for Excellence in the Study of Religion, Constructive Reflective Category. And it was also a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award in 2018. She is also the author of the 2009 book, Rosenzweig's Bible, Reinventing Scripture for Jewish Modernity. Mara Benjamin, welcome to Judaism Unbound. It's so great to have you. Great to be here. Thank you. So I thought we could start by understanding the gap in the thinking about God, about Jewish philosophy, et cetera, that you felt that this book was really stepping into. The place I started, to be honest, was 
I felt that the scholarship in my subfield, modern Jewish thought, was pretty limited in how it was done. I felt that there was, um, you know, I, and I had done this for my first book on Rosenzweig, you know, take one thinker or take two thinkers and, you know, just go deep right into their writings. And I just couldn't uh, really bear the thought of doing that as a second project. And at the same time, I had this newborn and a three-year-old and, you know, had my life kind of turned upside down by that. And in a way, the project came together when I realized that I could do something with Jewish thought and not just write another book about uh, like a dead German Jewish philosopher guy. <laughs> I guess like I'm asking a more global question about theology and writing about theology, like what, you know, why, ha why hasn't all the work been done already? You know, and obviously <laughs> what you're doing here is bringing a very unique perspective in the world of at least Jewish theology, which is the perspective of motherhood into theology. But I'm wondering, like, you know, I, I think that a lot of us, a lot of our listeners, probably we don't think about theology too much in a sophisticated way. I mean, do you believe in God? Do you not believe in God? You know, but I mean, <laughs> what what is really the, the question that you're taking on? Yeah, well, a piece of me was very attracted to German Jewish thought, in part because the philosophers and the thinkers that I have in my head, rattling around in my head, are themselves wanting to go beyond that simplistic notion. Do you believe in God? Yes or no. I mean, in what by the time you get to Kant, you know, in the late 18th century, you know, game over in a way for talking about proofs of God's existence and so on and so forth. No one's no one's talking about that anymore in the world of philosophy. And so then there's this question, well, if we're if we're not really talking about proving God's existence, yes or no, you know, what is it that we can say about the human experience of the divine? You know, is this something that we can actually come into contact with? Is this something that's totally removed from us? Where do we find God? How do we encounter this thing that goes beyond the human and beyond the worldly? And so I see especially the late 19th, early 20th century thinkers that I, you know, most uh, gravitate towards in this book and in my work, locating the divine, the experience of the divine in this intersubjective realm, right? In the world of my encounter with another human being and theirs with me. And that's where they say, you know, if we're going to be able to talk about God at all, it's going to be through this channel. We're not going to be able to just kind of have a completely, you know, um, ontologically, that is to say, like, is God really an existent or not, right? We're going to experience God through this meeting with another human. And so for me, that was a very powerful notion. And it was a notion that I, you know, I thought did a lot of great work for how we talk about theology. And yet it also, in my view, was limited in ways that I wanted to sort of build on and expand. So this is a great starting point, and I want to keep on rolling on this front. So you're talking about the intersubjective. So now we got to do the application of that point of the intersubjective onto the core, I don't know, two subjects, or sometimes they're blurred into one subject of your book, which is mother and child. And I actually, the way I just framed that sort of hints at where I'm going, like there's ways in which you talk about in your book how this both sort of affirms some of the notions that come up in that earlier Jewish thought of self and other, of relationship between, and the mother-child relationship kind of throws those things up in the air because there's a sense in which you're not entirely separate from that other thing, um, but you also are, and I, I wanted to hear in your voice um, out loud as opposed to just the text on the page, what's happening there? Like, how are you looking at those questions of self and other that come up in those thinkers and bringing them into this realm, which is to say mothers, which they really didn't look at because these were a bunch of guys um, reflecting on a bunch of other things that were previously done by guys generally, um, and you're bringing some really exciting stuff to light, both that's sort of new, but also looking at the old in a, in a new way. So that's a lot of stuff, but help us out. Take this intersubjective to those core two subject notions of your book, Mother and Child. Yeah, so I 
found um, that this idea of the intersubjective, my encounter with another person, um, as I said, a really rich place to start to ground theology. And that's what I love about the Buber and the Rosenzweig and the Levinas. And it's not just that I encounter another person and something happens in that interaction. It's also that the self is formed in a certain way through that relationality, right? It's formed by being in relation. And, you know, ask any developmental psychologist, this is obvious, right? Like from the baby point of view, you know, who you are is not completely contingent on who you're surrounded by and who cares for you, but there's a lot that happens in that, you know, we are relational creatures. And so the Jewish thinkers that are part of this tradition understand that philosophically to be true, right? That, that we're formed in relation. And for some of them, the more secular end would say we're formed in relation to another human being. And for the more theocentric ones, the ones who really kind of understand God as a real force, uh, they understand us as being formed in relation to the divine, in relation to God. But in any case, they're going beyond that kind of atomized notion where there's me here and you there, and we're separate. And we might, you know, come together and say, would you like fries with that? But basically, it's not a substantive... I <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it's not a substantive encounter. It doesn't shape me as a human. Um, so that's what I thought was so rich and exciting. And in a way, it made it even more aggravating and stupefying that they don't think about this kind of relationship that they themselves once engaged in as babies and that any human being alive today has been formed by. Like, it's so obvious. It was so right there. Why wasn't it clear to them? I don't know. I mean, I have my theories. But the point is, you know, when we talk about another person forming me and my ethical existence as a self being uh, tied up with another human being, to me, there is no greater and more obvious, more commonplace example of that than in the relationship that I have with a young, dependent, needy creature who, if he, she, they are to survive, it depends on me. Okay, so first off, I'm going to just like sticky note this for the future, not go into this now, but I'm finding it intriguing how in almost all of our conversations with folks who write books, the beginning of the story is an aggravation at <laughs> the world or, and I'm not saying that disparagingly. I just I want a sticky note. That's that. good to know um, because I think of myself as particularly annoyed by like other people in life, and so it's good to hear that I'm not alone. And you're you're certainly not alone. Maybe there's a Jewish thing here. Like there's the classic question that you ask of Jewish commentators, like what's bothering Rashi, right. as if something has to be bothering him in order to write. So like, but um, anyway, sticky noted. That's going to come up later, maybe. Um, so so now the now thing. Um. So we've got this relationship that has not been unpacked by some of the core Jewish and otherwise thinkers of the last few hundred years. You're diving in. Mother-child, what, I mean, at the risk of a ridiculously overwhelming question, like, give us an entryway into just, like, what is that relationship? Like, you, you gave us some already, but what should we be noticing about mother and child? And in what ways does that link both obviously and less obviously, to broader notions of Jewish thought of, I don't know, Judaism, et cetera? Well, you know, you say it's an overwhelming question, but honestly, this was such an overwhelming project in a way, because, you know, saying something that I would find palatable, at least, and I think that that others would find palatable about motherhood, it's like saying something about God or about, you know, the universe. It's like, it's a huge thing topic with so much internal diversity that it makes it, you know, really challenging to say anything and not feel like you're overreaching. And that was a real struggle for me throughout this book is like, how do I pick a few topics to talk about when I understand that what it means to be a parent, a female parent is so you know, historically contingent, geographically contingent, all of these things. Like, how can I say anything? And so 
For me, a part of how I made that determination was not saying, you know, these are the most important things about being a mother or being a caretaking parent. You know, it was more like, what's the intersection between things that I noticed and that I pondered as the mother that I was, which is also a mother informed by modern Jewish thought and Jewish practice, and what I perceive to be that repository of, you know, what we call Jewish tradition or Jewish ritual practice, right? So, you know, not only, but I would say that that was my guide for a lot of what I did in the book. So for instance, the chapter that it starts with, Obligation, um, begins with this question of the Jewish self in rabbinic thought. So let's say post-biblical, pre-modern, you know, that's a big stretch of time, but nonetheless, right, is a self that comes into the world encumbered, as it were, with obligations, or what we might call encumbered, right? And when I say we, I mean from the perspective of people who are trained and like come into the world with a rights perspective. And the rights perspective that we are familiar with in let's say the US constitution and our society is one in which, you know, we are free agents. We come together out of our own free will voluntarily to create a society, right? And we cede some of our freedoms for the sake of whatever it is we're getting, security, let's say. Um, And so that's the model of like, you start with an individual self And that individual self, surprise, surprise, is an adult, male, property-owning, you know, white self. And then that group of people comes together, right, and makes this agreement that's entirely voluntary. And so, you know, what I found so rich and exciting about the Jewish thought intersection with maternal experience is this idea that, you know, what what are you talking about? You start as this, you know, adult that somehow has survived into adulthood, has been, you know, diapered, has been fed, has been soothed, has been clothed, et cetera. You know, where is all that in the model and who's doing that labor? And so, you know, the, the idea of an obligated self that I think is so core to Jewish thought is this idea of coming into the world already in relation, already in relation with a collective, already in relation with other human beings where there's a certain set of, um, you know, understood duties that you have. And so that to me felt much closer to what I experienced about becoming a mother than this rights notion, you know. And, you know, it says something, I guess, about me and where I was in my own life, who I am, uh, what kind of society I live in, that I could at age, you know, 33 or whatever, suddenly have this experience of being, you know, impinged upon by the duties of caring for another person. I mean, that's crazy in a way, right? How weird is that, that um, you could have an adult get to that point. And yet we have a society of people for whom that is not necessarily a default. And we certainly have a society that's constructed with the idea that that is not the normal, right? You have to have special permission to, you know, take time off from work to care for somebody who needs care, right? Like, I mean, that's nuts. So it's a function of my you know, class, history, all kinds of things that I could be at that point. But nonetheless, it was so disorienting for me to suddenly be thrust into this position of, you know, needing to think about another person in a very material, very real embodied way. You know, it's not just like, oh, I should call so-and-so, they're lonely. You know, to have somebody whose life or death depends on whether you actually feed them. I mean, that's, terrifying and disorienting and ultimately, you know, very productive for me. (laughs) But that's, that's an example of how I tried to think about that intersection of where something that was true for me about motherhood, probably true for some other people besides me, met Jewish thought, but not trying to make a broad claim that like, this is the essence of motherhood. I mean, nothing in me could be further from that approach. 
I fear that I'm about to reveal something about uh, paternal subjectivity, but I remember in the days when my wife was pregnant and we were about to have this baby, I had this feeling like, you know, a stranger was going to come and live with us and <laughs> he would always be there. Like, you know, they just, and I don't know this person, right? You know, and, and there was just something kind of bizarre about it. I mean, I was also looking forward to it, but it was just a bizarre notion that some person was going to come who I don't know and... Right. And I I have to I mean, not that I wanted to get rid of him, but like I couldn't even if I wanted to. Right. I mean, it was like so. So what you're saying, um, you know, really resonates in, in that sense of of this obligation. I guess my question is two two things. One, when you think about the obligated self, are you thinking most dominantly about the parent as the obligated self or about the child as the obligated self or both? And, and I guess more broadly than that, what I'm curious about when we're doing modern Jewish studies or modern theology, what is it that you're trying to say about the understanding of God and of relationships that we've inherited? Because I, I just think about how the vast majority of the corpus of at least our texts comes from men, and they were not themselves having this maternally subjective experience. And I guess I'm asking, is this ultimately, does this does this lead you more often than not to a critique of what they put down, or does it lead you to an affirming of it? And if it's more of an affirming, and then how do we explain that they got it right? <laughs> wow, a lot of great things in what you just said. I mean, the first thing I just want to say about the inviting a stranger in or having a stranger come and live with you, to me, that's a profoundly ethical thought, um, potentially, right? Not only doesn't have to be, but, you know, for a thinker like Levinas, this idea of what do we owe the stranger who comes into our house that we're, we're kind of making room to be expanded and to be drawn out beyond what we understand to be the self or what is recognizable. I mean, that's a really, um, you know, that's one of those examples of something that I think, gosh, you know, people all over the world at every moment of the day are thinking about these really existential, profound questions, ethical questions. And why don't we have a way to talk about that besides, you know, mommy blogs, which God bless them. I mean, it's it's wonderful that people now have ways to connect about these things that they're feeling and encountering in these daily interactions. But why aren't there shelves and shelves of books about precisely that experience, right? Or precisely that question of, do I resemble this child? Does this child resemble me? What do I, you know, if so, then what? Because it's really a question of, if the stranger resembles me, the stranger on the street, what do I feel that I owe them that's different than perhaps what I owe a stranger? You know, if, if you have that line reverberating through your head of, you know, you were a stranger, what does it mean then ethically to invite a stranger? And so that, I just wanted to give that example of, God, what, how crazy it is that we don't have a really developed discourse within a kind of critical language to think about these things on a broader level. Um, I think of the it's the parent who's the obligated self. There's been, of course, lots and lots written about filial piety or filial obligation, depending on your culture, different terms are gonna be used. Um, what I found particularly lacking is looking at it from the perspective of the one who is offering care to a child. And I searched hard, I searched with help of people who know the Talmudic corpus, for instance, much better than I do. And it was remarkable how little was there that spoke directly to this question of what is it like to be that parental self. And what I came to understand is the parental self that is obligated, the rabbinic self. When you think about that, that seemed to me really important for thinking about what it means to be human self. Um, I felt like, well, this is, this is what it means to continue the tradition is to expand, repair, point to those places where it is limited and start to fill in the gaps. Well, 
that's very helpful in terms of uh, talking about how this is an expansion because it's a, a topic that we've talked about a bunch on this podcast and that I've really been thinking a lot about, particularly affirming Gitz Greenberg's idea that we're on the cusp of this next era of Judaism. And I've actually been thinking about dissent as one of the hallmarks that changes in each era of Judaism, so that in the biblical era, we were talking about patrilineal descent. In the rabbinic era, we were talking mostly about matrilineal descent. And I've been speculating whether perhaps in this next era, we'll be talking about nonlineal descent, meaning that it's really about choice. It's really about deciding that I want to take on this relationship. And I'm curious about how that connects to you're thinking into your book, because for me, it really does in the sense that I think that sometimes my position can be misunderstood and maybe our, the name of our podcast, Judaism Unbound, can be misunderstood to be this idea that there is no obligation, that everything's fair game. And that might be true for a certain period of time. I kind of think of ourselves as living in this in-between time, in this wilderness period, in this experimental period. But I imagine a future in which Judaism will kind of re-solidify. And at that point, it will be somebody's choice whether or not to embrace it. But once they do, I'm comfortable saying, but and this is more or less what it is, just as when I decide to marry a person, I'm marrying that person. I could try to change them a little bit, but my experience is that you don't change them too much. And that you you but you take on this obligation when you have a child even more so because they are your child no matter what and you but you decide at a certain point whether i want to become a parent in most cases and so i'm curious about how this idea of the obligated self potentially leads to an even even more of an expansion of of what we might mean in terms of the future of jewish connection and obligation yeah, I was actually thinking about the title of your show, Judaism Unbound, oh. because being bound is such a important word for me in this project, being tethered to another person. So, you know, I was like, ah, unbound, what, what, uh, what, what is that? And I looked at your <laughs> statement online about what that means. And I, I'll just say the first subordinate clause there, Judaism Unbound values the ways that you choose to connect to Judaism. And I was really caught by that and in your question, Dan, because I think of choice. For me, the word that sticks out to me from that is choice. Choice is a really interesting word that I think doesn't get the attention or analysis it deserves. And I think of choice as a kind of fetish word in this society. Um, there's kind of an inability that we have to account for the fact that why we do what we do as individuals is always partially obscured from view. That we think of choice as something that is, you know, we have control over it. We exercise it. It is the record that we leave when we look back at the things that happen to us in life, right? God forbid it's things that happen to us. No, it's choices that we all made. And of course, you know, we're familiar with a society in which there's a kind of punitive dimension to that um, on a legal and political level, right? Well, you made your bed, you know, go lie in it or pull yourself up by your bootstraps, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's a really, it's a powerful word. And for me, of course, we all exercise choice in trivial and non-trivial ways. But I don't think we have the same capacity that I wish we did to talk about choices that are constrained, choices that are not fully rational. In fact, most of the time, you know, the tip of the iceberg is the rationality. And then there's all of this other stuff underneath that is like, well, how, how do we make sense of the things that we do, why we do them? I mean, there's, there's so many different kinds of pulls on us. So, for me, motherhood and parenting was a perfect way to explore some of the paradoxes because I'm sitting here talking about how critical I am of this choice fetish at the same time, you know, if let's talk about abortion rights, I am firmly pro-choice. I mean, the language of choice is something that is very important to me as a feminist. And yet I think that we need a more complex vocabulary. And Let's think about this for a moment. Some people long to have children and can't have children. Some people wish never to become parents and then have parenthood thrust upon them, you know, 
And even those of us who want to have a child, we can want to have a child, but we can't want that particular child, right? What we get is a total crapshoot, you know, even if they are genetically related to us and a partner, right? It's still a crapshoot. And, you know, some people relinquish a child that they've brought into the world. Some people rear ch children they didn't bring into the world. I mean, it's so complicated. And how do we talk about that, that thicket of desire, choice, access, all kinds of things? I mean, I say this as somebody who is married to a woman who had to go through all kinds of very rational calculations in order to have a child, which, you know, really was unfortunate for me because I was so ambivalent that, you know, I thought many times, God, it would be so great to just have a, you know, an accidental, oh, whoops, there we go. Now we have a kid, right? I, I would have given anything at certain times for that irrational piece to come into my life. But, you know, it taught me something really powerful, which is that it's not all about rationality. And now back to Judaism, Judaism Unbound. Well, yeah, I think uh, going back to your sentence, it values the way that you choose to connect to Judaism. Great, I love that. And I love that there is this blessing being given for how people, you know, organize their Jewish lives. And I would say there's something that choice or choosing to connect to Judaism doesn't fully capture about how we are wired as beings, right? That uh, whether it's duty, whether it's nostalgia, whether it's longing for connection. I mean, there's a lot of things that power people or bring them into connection or lack of connection with Judaism and toward connection with others. So, you know, I value it in principle. I, I'm 100%, I'm but I think that part of the project is to try to give voice to a much more complex notion of who we are as people and the things that we don't choose, but that are nonetheless constitutive of who we are. So I'm really internalizing what you're bringing about obligation and about selves not being truly entirely separate from other selves. And um, what's funny is I like religiously and theologically actually have huge affinity for the the Buddhist idea of no self, of anatman, um, which is basically the idea that us being selves is kind of an illusion, like us being separate beings from one another. It's like something we create for ourselves in order to function. But in the grand scheme, we're all part of like a broader wholeness, which Okay, so that my metaphor now is planets. I can wander my way around Earth as, as a seemingly free agent, right? Like I, I can think of myself as being free and having choices. And if I want to getting on a plane, if I have, I mean, if I can pay for it, but like I can wander my way around Earth and feel that I actually am going anywhere I want to. In the grand scheme, I'm on a planet that is rotating around the sun and unless I'm going to be an astronaut and get all the gear and all the resources to like be able to leave the planet, like I'm actually restricted to my planet um, in the grand scheme. Like I can think of myself as free and an agent all I want, but I'm here on Earth. And I'm curious if that's sort of like if there are ways in which that's a kind of obligation. I mean, we, we have space travel now for like the small number of people that are able to travel planets. So that doesn't fully work. But I'm curious, like. Are there ways in which we could push ourselves on this choice question further and, and realize the ways in which we're not actually entirely free, even in the realms of our lives that are, that are not parenting? How would, you, how would you help us on that front? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think the thing that I hope people who have not had the experience themselves of being a daily caretaking parent will take the following from this book. They will take the idea that being a free agent is a myth, a very important myth in our current society, but not one that serves us well for developing a society in which we take responsibility for one another. 
I'm digesting your metaphor. I'm not sure I will be able to fully kind of inhabit it in this moment, although I want to think about it. But I'm not either. Okay. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> okay. We're doing our best with these metaphors. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the idea of freely walking about the planet, you know, the place that I go with that is thinking about the ways that the air I breathe. I mean, look, we're in the middle of a pandemic as we're recording this, right? And the air that we breathe is air that is shared. Right now, we're very aware of proximity to others being something that could be potentially quite dangerous. But the, the underlying principle is that we share this air, right? And that we, when we walk around, right, the roads have been paved by somebody's labor. We share those streets with other people. You know, other people help us with our you know, daily needs in all kinds of ways. And, you know, getting on a plane and say, well, if we can afford it, right? But, but like, think about not just the money that goes into buying the airplane ticket, but all of the, you know, hundreds of people whose actual hands have touched that machine that we might enter into. And then behind them, all of the, you know, centuries of, mathematical and engineering and all kinds of other things that have gone into that moment. You know, to me, that's, if we could internalize that, I think we'd have a really different society. The piece about motherhood that introduced, I, I wouldn't say it, you know, introduced me to that concept, but it certainly made it much more real and much more tangible and um, material, right? It's It's not just a theory. It's like, here we are constantly sharing um, pieces of who we are. You know, we have these traces of other people that we carry around with us and that inform us. So that's kind of the more existential place that I would go. How we translate that into thinking about Judaism, you know, back to your metaphor, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> but I do think that a really different notion of selfhood would help us out here. And I say that with an awareness of what I owe to feminist thought, which I think has rightly uh, made me kind of wary of going, you know, 100% toward a completely embedded notion of self, because I see that that, that has been deleterious for women, for all kinds of people over many centuries, right? To think, well, no, you, you don't really have a self. Your, your purpose here is to serve this other person or cause or whatever. So I'm, I'm always a little bit, I don't know, I have a certain kind of feeler out for that problem. <laughs> At the same time, I also think we need a big correction the other direction, at least for people who walk around the society not feeling constantly aware of their being part of other people and those other people being part of them. This is wonderful. And I just want to say out loud that like the ways in which you're pushing on our own name of Unbound on, <laughs> on some of our on some of the implications of our question, like it's exactly what we do this show for. So like, thank you. Um, and this will, this will help us moving forward and, and allow us to reconsider our own framework. So this is great. Um, to live in the like, I don't know, classical Judaism realm for a second, I, I'm thinking about how, and, and you did this in your book. That's part of why I'm asking. Like, I'm thinking about how even within the frameworks of rabbinic Judaism that you're that you're noticing gaps in, we can find some something there. Um, and I'm realizing I happened literally yesterday for a class I'm in this semester to do a little five minute presentation about two characters in the Talmud, about Rava and Abaye. And I say them both because the whole point is that they're almost always mentioned together in the Talmud. There's this sense in which they are, they're not even their own people. Like they're they're intertwined with each other. If you hear, ah, Abaye says X in the Talmud, you know that soon Rava's going to say Y and they're going to disagree with each other. Like Rava is said to win almost all of those arguments, um, which, you know, makes me sympathize with Abaye. But that doesn't matter for here. The point here is that they, they barely exist on their own. 
Like they are in, you can't tell a biography story of Rava without mentioning Abaye, and you can't tell a biography story of Abaye without mentioning Rava. And the same is true, the, the more familiar one to many folks might be Hillel and Shammai. If a text says the house of Hillel thinks X, you know house of Shammai is going to say Y. Um, that's a hint at something, I think. That's a, a powerful hint at something that the way that, I mean, look, first off, we don't know the extent to which any of these statements are like factual history. We don't know that these arguments happened in the way that they're described. That's important to say so people don't think this is like literal. But there's a powerful truth here, which is which relates to everything you're saying, which is Rava and Abaye shape themselves as selves in relation to the other one. And um, we shouldn't see that as like, wow, what an interesting, unique thing about the Talmud or something. I think that's actually more of an accurate reflection on on how we exist than how we think we exist, which is, ah, like, let's have a biography of Lex that's Lex's birth, Lex's doings in the world, followed by Lex's death. Like, that's not... That's not how it goes. And so I, I, I mentioned to you before we started that we, we had a conversation way back when with Tobin Belzer about the social self, which to me, it's not it's different, but it's it's close and related to the idea of the obligated self. And where she talks about basically that like this whole idea that we that we are our own thing and that to the extent people influence us, they influence us, right? Like they're separate from us and they're like mm -hmm. imparting something onto us as opposed to they are us in a sense. Um, that's where my mind eventually gets to. And I think like Jewish text actually has something to say there. So I'm curious, like, would you draw like I am with Rava and Abaye on other examples that, I mean, maybe they're guys, maybe they're not guys, um, how we can learn about this obligated self through Jewish tradition? Yeah, well, you know, you're bringing up a kind of dyadically formed self or, you know, these pairs where there's two thinkers who are constantly engaged with each other. And that's a wonderful illustration of it. And I would also say in those texts, the real collective or the real kind of super individual self is the collective self, right? The body of Israel, the people of Israel as that um, much broader unit within which selves are formed. So I'd say there's both, right? There's there's these individual relations, there's the chavruta relationship, the relationship between study partners, and also there's, of course, master and student, which is a really important um, relationship in Talmudic texts. Uh, and in part, I, you know, I use that in the book to think about what it means to be a teacher. One way to understand the teacher-student model is to think about it as the adaptation, usurpation, you might say, appropriation, you might say, of the kind of teaching that happens when children are very small and there are there's a small number of adults usually that they interact with who teach them how to be in the world you're pointing to the lateral relationship of two adult equals, um, which is a, a wonderful illustration of the way in which those, those rabbinic selves understand, you know, or the, let's say the authors of the Talmud, the compilers of the Talmud, understand that kind of social relationship as constitutive of selfhood. Um, I would want to also think about relationships, or I do think about in the book, relationships that are hierarchical in some sense. And here's where there's an important, I wouldn't say necessarily corrective, maybe expansion somewhere in between those of feminist ethics, which, you know, when I was looking for, okay, feminist ethics, treating motherhood, what do we find here? Well, we find a lot of wonderful writing about what should be the relationship between adult selves, men and women in romantic relationships, whatever other kinds of social horizontal lateral relationships, right? Trying to make a more level landscape on which people interact, which is great and I support. And yet what happens when we try to account for a relationship that is structurally hierarchical in some way, when there's an uneven power dynamic? To me, that's another place that rabbinic texts can help us think and also a place where we might want to step in and expand or reread those texts, right? To say, 
yeah, selves are also formed ideally in their world in these hierarchical relationships where there's a student who is being in some way formed by his, always his interaction with the teacher. Well, that's, there's something really profound there and any of us even today who don't live in the kind of society the rabbis lived in, but you know, many of us can recall a profoundly influential teacher who we understand as having shaped us and made us who we are, right? And yet there's a whole prior history that is there before we get to be a self that goes off to school or goes off to have this relationship. So that's another way in which I see those texts as doing something really important and powerful and that runs counter to a lot of what is more widely available to us now and yet needing to be expanded, rethought, put to work in a different way. I wanted to go back to, you mentioned the pandemic and you published this book before the pandemic. And I'm wondering whether it's the pandemic or some of what's going on in our society in terms of democracy. I feel like we're going through some of these stress tests of our ethics. I feel like a lot of religious groups, including certain elements within the Jewish community, in my view, are coming up wanting. In other words, it doesn't seem that the corpus of religious material and ethics has led where I might have expected it to lead, which was this idea that we're all in it together. We all have to look out for one another. It feels like the whole idea of wearing a mask, as I understood it, and as I understand it, was always about, it's not to protect yourself, it doesn't work as well to protect yourself, it's about protecting other people, because what it does do is catch your coughs and sneezes, more of it inside your your zone, and that's really what it's about, and yet instead we have this discourse that's largely about, especially in certain religious communities, that it's about personal rights, like you were talking about. It's about, it's about, well, it's my choice. It's like, well, it's not your choice to stop at a red light or not. It's not your choice to do other things that involve the safety of another person. But for some reason, in this case, at least the mask has been put into the category of it's about my choice. And it strikes me that the religious leadership didn't take the opportunity to reframe all that in terms of our obligations towards others, especially towards others over whom we have power, maybe only because we live in proximity to them, but maybe for other reasons as well. And if the discourse had been different, just the discourse, the result might have been very different. And I'm curious about how you feel that connects to what you're talking about. And more broadly, I guess, it's also a question about whether somehow this stress test that we've undergone has shown that something is really lacking in the way that we're doing religion these days. And and if you could sort of talk about some of that in the framework of what you wrote about. One of the things that I think it's really exposed is what happens when you allow a society to develop without an adequate understanding about how care for the other does limit my personal quote unquote freedom or autonomy, but that the person's in my view, who insist on this version of autonomy are really ethically limited, right? To have such a narrow understanding of the self that is not constituted by this broader society that we live in, right? By by who who are you if you just end up all by yourself with your freedom, right? You, You know, I mean, you're kind of a monster in a way. So, to me, this, this society has gone so awry in that way. And for some reason, we're still at this point where socialism can be used as a slur and where you know all kinds of ways of talking about caring for others as, yes, limiting your freedom to not wear a mask, right? That is correct. That is a limit on your freedom. So what, right? So you are contributing to this larger good. But I think you're right that it's a real missed opportunity for religious leaders to step up and to articulate something that is so apparently dangerous to articulate in, you know, sort of secular political discourse, which is we have to care for each other and this is how we do it. 
Okay, so first, I really want to affirm what you just said about the gap we have in our society and the need we have to fill that gap and alter the way that we approach sort of collective understandings of the world so that we don't all think we're looking out for ourselves as opposed to looking out for our communities, for the world, all of it. Um, so that's huge, and I really hope we internalize that. Um, now, I also want to return to that wonderful sticky noted topic that came up earlier, which is aggravation and how, I mean, I mentioned this before, but how often it seems that the beginning of people's stories on our podcast, when they're talking about, often it's an institution they started where they say, oh, I was just so aggravated at the world that there wasn't X institution organization available. So I ended up just feeling sufficiently moved to start it myself. Um, we hear that a lot and we hear it with books too, that there's a gap in whatever academic field and an author comes along and says they're going to fill that gap. So I wanted to hear from you about that. And I also, in doing so, wanted to bring up my own aggravation with Jewish thinkers, Jewish teachers, which like I am taking a class this semester called Jewish Feminist Thought. Jewish Feminist Thought implies that there is Jewish thought that's separate from feminist. And so Jewish feminist, like I took a class called Modern Jewish Thought earlier in rabbinical school. I can tell you, it, it was all the people you talked about. It, it was, you know, Franz Rosenzweig and Mordechai Kaplan and Levinas and all, all of the set of mostly 19th and 20th century white European Jewish men. And now, I mean, I could have taken this class earlier. It's just, that's how it played out. But like, Jewish feminist thought is like a nice addition, a nice separate thing that we can also do. And I think that, look, I don't think there's that many people that are non-Orthodox Jews that are arguing against like Jewish feminist thought or even of feminist approaches to Judaism. I think at this point, I'm very thrilled that most people are, are ready in abstract to do that. But at the same time, I feel like we still talk about like Jewish thought in quotes, Jewish philosophy in quotes as, ah, that's this set of enshrined thinkers, of white male thinkers. We can trace the lineage from the Talmud through medieval thinkers, through those Jewish philosophers that we talked about through now. And oh, yeah, end of the syllabus. We can throw on Judith Plaskow. A wonder, I mean, I would start many syllabi with Judith Plaskow and others. Like, this is my aggravation. I have a sense from your book that you share it in certain senses. And so I know this is kind of a meta question. It's not just about your book, but I'm nervous that somebody could listen to this episode or could read your book and think, ah, wow, what a great addition to all of the other Jewish thought things that are mostly white European guys, as opposed to, wow, this is a reframe of the entirety of how we could approach this system. And I know it's it's like hard to ask you to say how important your book is. That's like it it's but like yeah, I do I'm think it's do important. <laughs> I know, but like um I, I do think it's important. Like how would somebody use this book and how could we sort of take this as a starting point into actually disrupting the categories that we have of like ah Jewish thought and then separate from that feminism, motherhood, nice window dressing on top of the Sunday. Yeah, you're asking a really, you know, a profound question, a pedagogical question. I mean, this is something that I think about a lot. I, you know, I teach undergraduates and I put together my introduction to Judaism course, which is a separate course from my women and gender in Judaism course. Right. And part of what I do as an exercise with my students in especially in I think I've done it in the women and gender classes thinking, OK, how based on this course, should an introduction to Judaism be taught? So it's something that I go through every time I make my own syllabus, is how am I going to decolonize my syllabus? How do I not, you know, kind of reinstitute the Ashkenazi privileging? How do I not reconstitute the male, you know, gaze, the patriarchy of this tradition? That's not what I want to pass on to my students, right? How do I do something different right here, right now? That's not about starting with, you know, the classics and then finally getting to feminism, rethinking it. And so you're asking something that has big philosophical stakes, high philosophical stakes, and also something that 
becomes very practical because you just illustrated it with your syllabus question. And those are the syllabi that I'm also making. So I don't have a simple answer to this, but what I have tried to do is rethink what are our sources? How do we know what we know and what are the gaps? What's not there? And that's where you started your question, right? With the absence, the moment of not having, not understanding is crucial to the process, right? You only start learning when you realize that you don't understand something. You only start to build towards something new when you can see that there's something missing. And so Part of what I want to do in my courses with undergraduates is help them see what's missing from the record, what's missing from our understanding, um, what is the slice of Jewish society that's being represented here, and what about all those other people, whether it's you know early Jewish Christians who have been kind of written out of the paths of Jewish development that has this very neat trajectory, or whether it's heretics or whether it's women, et cetera. So it's, it's a challenge because I also really love the texts that we do have, many of them, you know, not all, but I, I love Talmud. I love getting students acquainted with Talmud or Midrash as something that just completely challenges their understanding of what a religious text is. Um, and how you go about making a philosophical point. I mean, that's really exciting for me to teach. So I, I think it's an ongoing challenge and it's one that I hope is felt and I know is felt by, by many colleagues in terms of thinking, how am I going to teach what this tradition is to this younger generation, right? Am I just gonna replicate the same thing or am I going to challenge that. So as we round out this episode, just to close, is there anything that you just want to leave our listeners with and leave us with in terms of a call to action um, for how we can apply the teachings of your book and, you know, your teachings that aren't just from this book, but more broadly to Jewish tradition, to our Jewish future? To allow ourselves to think that our own lives might furnish questions for that tradition and be questioned by the tradition is the exciting thing. To investigate what is that understanding of self, of community, of the world um, that we find in there that really jostles things that we think are the furniture of the universe, but actually can be moved and perhaps should be. Let's jostle the furniture of the universe. I love that <laughs> phrase. We're going to end with it. Thank you so much, Mara Benjamin, for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. I've loved it. And thank you so much to all of you out there for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. and We hope that you'll tune in again in the future. As a reminder, we've got Hanukkah coming up. It's a big deal. People might want to tell you that it's a small deal, but Hanukkah is a big deal. We've decided and, you know, it's fun. You should come spend it with us in our Hanukkah eight-night extravaganza called the Gelt Razor, which you can join at geltrazor.com. It's going to be a blast. There's going to be amazing guests. There's also going to be me and Dan, but mostly the amazing guests. And we would love to hang out with you, get to know our listeners better. It's going to be a ball. So that's a little reminder. And the other thing we love to close our episodes with is a request that you contact us. We really enjoy that. And there's a bunch of ways for you to do that. You can send us your questions, your thoughts, your comments, your concerns. All of it is good. And here are all the different avenues for doing so. There's our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. There's our Instagram and Twitter accounts, also Judaism Unbound. There's our website, JudaismUnbound.com. There's a common theme here with the Judaism Unbound stuff. And there's our email addresses, Dan at JudaismUnbound.com or Lex at JudaismUnbound.com. The last request we have is that we deeply appreciate any amount of financial donation that you can send our way. And you can do that via JudaismUnbound.com slash donate on either a monthly recurring basis or just as a one-time gift. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.